The worlds of music and the arts have been at the forefront of opposition to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And when a new run of Puccini's opera Turindo was about to open in New York, its leading lady, a Russian, was dismissed for her support of President Putin. In some sort of poetic justice, a Ukrainian soprano has been chosen to replace her, and she's taking New York by storm. <laughs> Some of the most powerful voices in the world have graced the stage of the Metropolitan Opera in New York. Now the Met is using the power of its voice to hold the powerful to account. Lyudmila Monasterska is one of Ukraine's most acclaimed sopranos. She's just replaced her Russian colleague, banished for her support of President Putin. Ukraine says its forces have recaptured villages from Russian troops around its second largest city of Kharkiv, which is just 30 miles from the Russian border. Let's speak to our reporter, Joe Imud, who's in the western city of Lviv for us. Morning to you, Joe. Bring us up to date on what has clearly been some pretty intense fighting uh, around Kharkiv. Yeah, so this is the main focus of Ukrainian kind of counter-offensive, if you will. They're trying to recreate what they achieved around Kyiv, around the capital, a few months ago. What they're doing is they're pushing the Russian troops back and back from around this, the second city. It's a, a big place and a strategically important place. But the most, I think, crucial thing they're trying to achieve at the moment is pushing the Russian artillery, those Russian guns, more than 20 kilometres from the city centre. Because once they do that, once they can get them out of bombardment range, it means the people of Kharkiv, there were a million and a half of them before this war started, can finally get some respite from the continuous bombardment. Now, we should say this doesn't appear to be a full-blown retreat, as we saw around Kyiv. The Russians seem to be with, uh, regrouping and are trying to bring battalion tactical groups, their big kind of units, trying to bring some of them in. But if they do that, that means they weaken their offensive around the Donbass, around the east of the country. And the more they do that, the more this whole thing becomes a stalemate, although an increasingly bloody one. Well, Britain and Finland have signed a mutual security deal hours after the UK agreed a similar deal with Sweden against the background of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said the UK will not hesitate to act to defend against any threat from what he called a 21st century tyrant. He's been visiting both countries, which are considering a NATO membership in the face of President Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. So one piece of breaking news for you. Just in the last few minutes, Finland has confirmed its intention to join NATO. Let's speak to our Europe editor, Katja Adler, who's in the Finnish capital of Helsinki. Katja, very good morning to you. This has been much talked about, but literally in the last few minutes, the first confirmation. Uh, well, that's right. We've heard um, in a written statement from Finland's prime minister and president uh, their opinion that their country should apply for NATO membership as soon as possible. There is still, um, you know, some kind of bureaucratic uh, hurdles, if you like. Parliament has to give its nod, but it's really expected uh, as a complete formality because there is a parliamentary uh, majority here for joining NATO as very much... Um, it's the opinion of the public here in Finland as well. A dramatic change provoked by Russia's invasion of Ukraine beforehand. I mean, Finland is traditionally militarily uh, neutral. Um, it's chosen to work alongside but not inside uh, NATO up until now. And before Russia's invasion, public opinion polls were saying 20 to 30 percent uh, of Finns were in favour of joining NATO. The latest poll suggests a whacking 76 uh, percent of Finns want to join. And of course, the alliance has, you know, that priority, that all for one and one for all clause that says an attack against one is seen as an attack against all, particularly in importance of Finland, uh, which shares an 800 mile long border uh, with Russia. Katja, just take us through some of the basics there. You talked about the border there, which is a very long border with Russia. Um, Finland has a, a, a major military uh, armed force, doesn't it? This is a substantial uh, military organization. It, it absolutely is. And, you know, um, neighbouring Sweden is also expected to say that it, it would like to join uh, NATO within the coming days. And 
Vladimir Putin has threatened retaliation here if those uh, countries join. Uh, he's always hated NATO's eastward expansion. Uh, and this brings the military alliance that much closer. He'll feel that much more, you know, pressurized. Those two countries joining would hugely bolster the eastern flank militarily, particularly uh, in Finland's case, it would be really important. Um, the two countries, as I say, already work alongside the NATO military alliance. Um, there are joint exercises. So, you know, the military alliance would welcome them. Um, they are ready militarily, but also just that presence uh, in the east. Um, the countries of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia will feel safer, Norway as well, and it will give NATO a big presence uh, in the Baltic Sea. So it's seen as a win-win. And as far as those threats uh, from Moscow, when you talk to politicians and diplomats here in Finland, they say, look, we're not expecting Russian military vehicles to be rolling in across that large border of, of ours anytime soon. Russia has got its hands tied militarily in Ukraine, they say. Just look, it had to withdraw from around uh, the Ukrainian capital Kiev. So the kind of retaliation they're looking at is probably more in the form of um, cyber attacks, disinformation campaigns uh, from Russia, which they say they're already used to, uh, or um, Russian uh, jets uh, invading their, their airspace. But they say that's something they can absolutely cope with. And in the meantime, in between sort of saying they want to join and NATO officially saying come in. There's that kind of grey area. Well, the Prime Minister was here yesterday and Germany and the US have already said uh, we will come to your support, uh, Finland and Sweden, um, should you be attacked. Ukrainian prosecutors say that they're ready to open their first war crimes trial against a Russian soldier accused of shooting a civilian. Police have been gathering evidence of similar killings by Russian forces across Ukraine and the BBC has found its own evidence of how two unarmed men were killed near Kyiv. Our Eastern Europe correspondent Sarah Rainsford has the details. These are Russian soldiers on their way to loot and to kill. But their every move is caught on multiple cameras. And so is Leonid, the security guard, as he approaches them. The men talk, even smoke, and then the soldiers leave. But suddenly two turn back. They shoot Leonid and a second man multiple times in their backs. Leonid somehow survives. His boss dead, the guard staggers back to his hut and starts phoning for help. I met one of the friends Leonid called that day. He told Vasya the soldiers claimed they don't kill civilians. Then they shot him. I asked how he was. I said, can you at least bandage yourself up? And he said, Vasya, I barely crawled here. Everything hurts so much. I feel really bad. So I told him to hang in there and started calling the territorial defense. The Russians drove a stolen van, daubed with their V symbol and the words Russian tank special forces. And this is the man we saw shooting now helping himself to a drink. He has no idea he's being filmed. No one does, until it's too late. And all this time, Leonid is hiding in here, bleeding heavily. Weeks later, we found his clothes and mattress bundled up outside. He died before help could reach him. I met the men who tried to save Leonid, Sasha and Kostya, who sold air conditioning before the war. As they rushed to the scene that day, they tried to reassure Leonid that he'd make it, but they were scared themselves. We went there knowing the risk, under fire. We knew the Russians would come back and they had tanks, and we only had our guns. So our chances were not equal, but we had to go and get him. They show me how the nearby road looked in those days, with Russian tanks rolling past their positions. Police have told us the Russians shot at anything that moved here. They found the bodies of 37 civilians on just this stretch of road. It's not just the burnt out buildings and businesses along this road that you see, but things like this two Russian tanks just lodged in the forest and you can see the V's painted on the front 
And it's a, a really stark reminder of just how fierce the fighting was all along these roads into Kiev and how terrified Leonid must have been as he was lying there bleeding and calling for help. Leonid's daughter shared this image of her dad as she'd like him remembered. Yulia is abroad now. She tells me she wants her father's killers to face justice. My dad was not a military man at all. He was a pensioner. They killed a 65-year-old. What for? I'm not so much furious as full of grief and fear. These damn Russians are so out of control that I'm afraid of what they might do next. Leonid never returned to his home or his pets. Another life stolen by Russian troops, now notorious for their brutality. Sarah Rainsford, BBC News, Kiev.